In 2007, astronomers spotted a massive 54-ton asteroid roaming space relatively close to our planet. But later, they lost track of it. That's why the space rock was declared a lost asteroid. Almost two decades have passed since then. And in November 2023, a report claimed that the lost asteroid, aka 2007 FT3, might hit Earth in 2024. Such news sounds ominous. But how true is it? Well, NASA disagrees. The U.S. Space Agency has refuted the worrying claims. This statement was issued in response to the announcement that there was a 1 in 11.5 million chance of the asteroid striking our planet on the 5th of October, 2024. The space agency states that at any time in the next century, there are no known asteroids that could pose an impact threat to Earth. NASA and other space agencies are watching the skies nonstop, determined to find, track, and categorize asteroids and NEOs near Earth objects. Hundreds of millions of rocks orbit the sun within the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. But only some of them come relatively close to Earth. NASA classifies asteroids orbiting within 30 million miles of our planet as near-Earth objects. Inside this group, there are particularly worrisome objects. Those are so large and orbit so closely to our home planet that they might turn into a real threat to the world should a direct collision occur. Luckily, the larger an asteroid is, the easier it is for our planetary defense experts to find it. The orbits of the largest space rocks around the sun are normally well-known and determined for years and even decades. At the moment, NASA is keeping a close eye on an asteroid named Bennu. It's a fairly large space object reaching 1,610 feet across. It might smash into our planet in 159 years. According to experts, the asteroid, which was first spotted in 1999, is quite likely to drift into the orbit of our planet. If it happens, it might collide with Earth by the 24th of September, 2182. Asteroid Bennu is thought to be taller than the Empire State Building. If it hits our planet, the collision will release 1,200 megatons of energy. That's an enormous amount of energy that nothing built on Earth could produce. But even though Bennu's chances of colliding with Earth are quite low at the moment, the space rock has still been categorized as a potentially hazardous asteroid. All because it might come as close as 4.65 million miles from Earth. That's the reason why it's also classified as a near-Earth object. Asteroid 99942-942 Apophis, also known under the dramatic name of the God of Chaos, is another space body we'd better watch out for. It's a near-Earth object about 1,100 feet across. It was discovered in 2004, and at first it was identified as one of the most dangerous asteroids ever detected. Apophis gained notoriety very fast. It was believed to pose a serious threat to Earth. Experts predicted that it would come uncomfortably close to our planet in 2029. Luckily, after a more careful examination of Apophis and its orbit, astronomers concluded that there was no risk of the asteroid colliding with our planet for at least a century. The risk of an impact in 2029 was ruled out completely, as well as the potential impact that could be caused by the asteroid's close approach in 2036. Interestingly, until March 2021, there was still a small chance of a collision in 2068. But then, Apophis made a flyby of Earth, and astronomers took this chance to use powerful radars to estimate the asteroid's orbit around the Sun more precisely. This allowed them to rule out any impact risk for at least the next 100 years. Asteroids aren't as rare on our planet as we may think. About 17,000 of them visit us every year. You've probably seen at least one in your life. For example, if you've seen a shooting star, they leave these bright tails behind them as they pass through Earth's atmosphere. Of course, they only look beautiful in the sky. If they reach the ground, the consequences would be catastrophic. Luckily for us, most of them explode 30 to 50 miles above the surface. Their mass is too small for them to withstand such a journey to the end, so most of them remain harmless to us. But we shouldn't underestimate them. Let's start with the smallest ones. One to three foot high asteroids are about the size of a person. They're too small to cause any real damage. Most often, they explode in the atmosphere without even reaching its lower layers. But at the same time, they splash up tons of energy over the surface every time. 
13 to 15 foot asteroids, the height of giraffes and mammoths. These larger meteorites come to us less often, once a year and a half. Like the previous ones, they, fortunately, don't pose a serious threat, but they splash out much more energy. 30 feet, the height of a three to four story building. They visit us once every 10 years, and now we're talking seriously. It throws out a wave that could demolish an entire city. I think you understand how catastrophic the consequences would be if this asteroid touched Earth. 65 feet, multi-story building. They like to visit Earth once every 60 to 70 years. Good news, it explodes at 12 miles above the ground. Its released energy could destroy an entire region if it touched the ground. Bad news, such an asteroid has already visited us recently, and the consequences were pretty rough. It all happened in a city called Chelyabinsk. On February 15, 2013, at about 9.20 a.m. local time, the giant slowed down in the Earth's atmosphere and then broke up into small pieces at 14.5 miles above the Earth. These pieces then flew in different directions. It shattered the windows all over the city and damaged many buildings, including people's houses, schools, and others. It took a while to repair everything, and the scale of this destruction was quite serious. As a result, there were 1,615 injured, but fortunately, no casualties. At least we're safe for the time being. The next such asteroid may come to us only in the 2070s or 80s, and no one knows where exactly it wants to land. Now let's move on. 300 feet. This is the height of the Statue of Liberty together with the pedestal. Such a giant can be seen every 4,500 years. And this is the first asteroid on our list that may literally crash into Earth. The consequences are disastrous. Not only may it demolish an entire city, but it can also set fire to neighboring areas. Well, some people even witness such a meteorite land on our planet. The notorious Tunguska meteorite is the biggest asteroid disaster that people have ever seen. It all happened on June 30th, 1908 in eastern Siberia. The meteorite was bright, like a second sun, and people felt the heat wave when it just approached the Earth. It exploded near the river. Fortunately, the whole area was surrounded by taiga, and there were no big cities nearby. But even there, it immediately destroyed a lot of trees. Serious forest fires broke out. The sound of the explosion was heard by people hundreds of miles around. At tens of miles around, all the house's windows broke. The magnetic storm that resulted from this collision lasted five hours. The consequences were truly disastrous, but perhaps this is not the worst thing that awaits humankind. 99942 Apophis, 1,215 feet. It's slightly bigger than the Eiffel Tower. This meteorite, as scientists discovered in 2013, will be our next guest. Collisions of such force occur in about 100,000 years, and this one is gradually approaching. The force of such an explosion is equal to the force of the catastrophic eruption of the Krakatoa volcano in 1883. This eruption is considered one of the most destructive in history. It caused a terrible tsunami. 165 cities and settlements were completely destroyed, and another 132 were seriously damaged. People all around the globe could feel the consequences of this eruption, at least to some degree. Such an asteroid could leave a 3.5 mile crater, and this is one we'll face in the distant future. But calm down, no need to panic yet. By 2070, the meteorite will be almost 174 million miles away from us. It still has a very long journey ahead of it, so we're safe for at least 100 years, or even more. Besides, our planet has survived something even worse. 3,280 feet. This is higher than the tallest tower in the world, the Dubai Burj Khalifa Tower. Such collisions occur once every 500,000 years. We're not sure when such a collision occurred the last time. 70% of our planet is covered with water. If such meteorites fell into the ocean, it would be extremely difficult to find their traces. But we can assume the possible consequences. The wave would have swept across the entire hemisphere. The crater would be about 9 miles in diameter, and that would be a complete disaster. The last event of such a force happened 26 to 28 million years ago. It was an eruption of the supervolcano La Garita, which is located in the southwest of Colorado, USA. It was one of the most powerful known supervolcanic phenomena in history. 
During this monstrous eruption, a significant part of the current state of Colorado was destroyed. Scientists are still not sure how far the ashes have spread, but there was an even bigger meteorite in the history of mankind. The consequences of that impact were irreversible for an entire species of animals. I think you know what I'm talking about. Chichila meteorite, the thing that wiped the dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. This happened about 66 million years ago. These collisions in general happen about every 500 million years. The height of the Chichilu meteorite was 12.4 miles. It's so high that when it touched the ground, it could reach the stratosphere. Even looking at the 124-mile diameter crater left by this meteorite, you can understand how huge it was. When it collided with the Earth, millions of tons of energy were released. This is an unimaginable disaster. It fell at a very steep angle, creating a giant cloud of dust and chemicals that spread around the world. This dust had a very thin layer, but also a mass of 50 trillion tons. The shockwave swept across the entire planet. It caused several earthquakes. Volcanoes began to erupt actively. Forest fires broke out everywhere, all over the world. The amount of soot and carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere is invaluable. The Earth was closed from the sun for several days. Darkness reigned all over the planet. Planets couldn't produce enough oxygen, so there was nothing to breathe. The temperature on the continents and in the oceans dropped by an average of 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Sounds horrific, doesn't it? And, of course, it caused one of the greatest extinctions in the history of the Earth's biosphere. Amazingly, the Earth was able to recover after such a catastrophe. This event became the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic eras. So now, those who wondered, how could a small meteorite destroy all the dinosaurs? Probably understand the answer. Perhaps the largest collision in the history of our entire planet was not a collision with a meteorite, but with an entire planet. This happened many, many billions of years ago. Theia, as this hypothetical dwarf planet was called, crashed into our Earth, releasing an incommensurable amount of energy, just quadrillions of fuel. The Earth then instantly turned into a giant fire, and it was this collision that led to the creation of the Moon. All that sounds terrifying, I know, so let's just hope that you and I will never see anything like this. If an asteroid like Apophis hits Earth, we will be destroyed. Massive earthquakes will strike, and tsunamis will flood everything. Apophis is a billion-year-old celestial body that has been in the solar system since its inception. So you might be thinking, well, how likely is it that this giant space stone will collide with our planet in 2029? Well, let's find out, shall we? Apophis is a big, bad asteroid discovered in 2004 by the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. Since then, it has proudly held the title of one of the most dangerous asteroids ever located. It's around 1,100 feet wide, which is a bit bigger than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. Because of how scary it is, it was named Apophis, like the Egyptian immortal creature that was considered to bring eternal darkness and destruction to Earth. Oh boy! In 2021, researchers had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study this floating rock when it passed near our planet. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, some scientists say that there is a small chance of Apophis hitting the Earth on Friday, April 13, 2029. The Yarkovsky effect is to blame for this, since it can slightly nudge the space rock towards Earth. This effect originates from the uneven emission of thermal photons from a rotating celestial object, resulting in a fascinating force exerted upon it in space. These emitted photons possess momentum and play a pivotal role in shaping the dynamics of the body. The asteroid has two sides, light and dark, just like the Moon. The light side faces the Sun and is warmer than the dark side. But the thing also turns, so the sides constantly change direction and temperature. This change could be detrimental because it slightly pushes Apophis toward Earth. Unfortunately, nobody knows how the Yakovsky effect will influence the asteroid's path. On the other hand, on the asteroid's last flyby of Earth in 2021, 
Astronomers used radar to take accurate measurements of its trajectory and confidently concluded Apophis will safely miss Earth in 2029 by about 20,000 miles and won't bother us again for at least 100 years. Now, generally speaking, every 8,000 years, our planet is hit by a falling star that has similar dimensions to those of Apophis. The last time we were hit by a slightly smaller meteor was in 2013. A new spacecraft developed by NASA called the OSIRIS-REx was launched in 2016 to collect samples from another slightly less terrifying celestial body called Bennu. Four years later, it finally arrived at the thing, got some samples, quickly said goodbye to Bennu, and started traveling back towards Earth. The samples were safely stored in a capsule dropped in Utah. So far, this has been the most significant sample ever taken from an asteroid. After the delivery, the spacecraft didn't waste any time and started chasing Apophis. Now, OSIRIS-REx has been renamed to OSIRIS-APEX and is currently playing tag with Apophis. With some luck, on the 2nd of April 2029, when the asteroid zips close by Earth, the spacecraft will reach Apophis and land on it. It will stay on Apophis for 18 months, collecting valuable information and taking thousands of pictures. The asteroid will be monitored with the help of powerful telescopes. At some point, Apophis will get too close to the Sun, and then all the monitoring work will be on Osiris's apex back. If you live in Europe, West Asia, or Africa, you're one of those lucky people who will have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Apophis with the unaided eye. It'll be visible in the sky in these regions in 2029, and those who have telescopes will be able to spot it once again in 2036. Osiris Apex will experience some problems because the asteroid has a thick crust, and the spacecraft won't be able to collect data as easily as it did with Bennu. Osiris Apex has a unique thruster that will blow all the dust from Apophis while landing. This will be a perfect chance to analyze the surface of the asteroid to see what it's made of. The craft will spend one and a half years mapping the asteroid, trying to detect changes in its shape. All this research will show how the celestial body is likely to move so we can better design plans to protect Earth from such things. In 2025, NASA is also going to launch the mission Apophis Pathfinder, and it will be the first spaceship to ever touch this asteroid. It will land approximately a year after its launch. Also, NASA has proposed sending a swarm of tiny craft into space to help humanity develop effective protective tactics against asteroid strikes. We know that Apophis originated in the primary asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. In the past million years, this celestial body has changed its path because of the considerable influence of Jupiter's gravitation. Now it seems like it favors the Sun more, meaning this asteroid will come very close to Earth. That's why it's classified as a near-Earth celestial body. A lot of tests and research have been done to find a way to deal with asteroids. Some solutions include drilling and detonating the space body from inside, or testing new technologies, like attaching rockets to it and trying to steer it away from Earth. We can also hit it with something moving at high speeds to make it change its course. Apophis is an S-type asteroid made of rocks and minerals like iron and nickel, and is shaped like a peanut. It can tell us a lot about the past and possibly the future. Sampling this space object could reveal how life on Earth began and how plants appeared. There are many theories that suggest that water arrived on our planet on an asteroid or a comet. Asteroids are like priceless time capsules. Unlike rocks on Earth, which have undergone thousands of changes, like erosion, most celestial bodies are still intact and much easier to study. When meteors fall on Earth, they get covered in debris that's impossible to clean. That's why studying Apophis while it's still in space is so important. Also, some asteroids are made of precious metals like platinum. Right now, we have a high demand for metals that we use in production, and mining metals on Earth is quite tricky. Just one large meteor might have iron, nickel, gold, and platinum that could last us millions of years. If Apophis has this amount of metals, 
Well, we'd want to break it down and bring it back to Earth. One space rock could be worth quadrillions of dollars, making space mining highly profitable. And still, it would cost us more to get it back to Earth than to dig up these materials here. As technology progresses, and new kinds of rockets are developed, this might become possible at some point. So, even though we're safe for the next 100 years from Apophis, you probably still want to see what would happen if something like it did impact. Come on, sure you do. Well, first let me tell you, you'll hear the sound of the collision and know what's happened even if you're miles away. You should leave your house or apartment immediately. Shortly after the impact, massive earthquakes will strike, and many tall buildings will fall. So staying away from cities might be your best option if you have a choice. But don't escape by car. There will be massive traffic jams, and everyone will panic. Going on foot or by bike is your best option in this scenario. A prime way of transportation will be traveling by plane. So if you've always wanted to get that pilot license, now you've got a good excuse. If you have time, take along extra snacks and water and an extra pair of socks. It's nice to live by the ocean or the sea, but in this scenario, it's the worst place to be because giant tsunami waves will hit coastlines after the impact. If you live far away from the impact area, the tsunami might take 30 hours to arrive. You'll have a bit of time to prepare. We're flying past the planets of our solar system. We pass by Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Then we move through dark space beyond the edge of our world. We've reached our destination. It's the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical region around the solar system that holds tons of asteroids and blocks of ice. It's likely to be where the largest comet in human history was born. And now, it's heading toward the sun. Bernard and Nellie Bernstein was discovered totally by accident during the Dark Energy Survey. Our telescopes were pointed at distant space. Their main goal was to learn more about how the universe was expanding. Astronomers also wanted to make a more detailed map of the observable universe. Scientists analyzed over 80,000 images and found a moving object. It was alarmingly close to our home planet. Its size was an impressive 62 miles. That's about the width of Lake Michigan. It was an already active comet with a long tail. Usually, comets get a tail when they come close to the sun. The heat from the star warms the comet's surface, and light materials, like ice, begin to evaporate. This forms a cloud of steam and dust that stretches far beyond the comet. But Bernardinelli Bernstein is too far away from the sun to start heating up. This means that its surface has a different composition. It might be solid carbon monoxide. This increases the luminosity of the comet. That's why it can be observed with telescopes on Earth. We can compare Bernardinelli Bernstein to the largest meteorite to ever fall on Earth. About 66 million years ago, our planet was hit by a meteorite about six miles wide. At that time, the blast wave from the collision went around Earth several times. Tsunami waves caused by the impact were taller than the largest skyscrapers, and the energy from the explosion set huge areas on fire. Almost all living creatures, including dinosaurs and ancient fish, ceased to exist. The meteorite left a crater three times the size of Manhattan. The place where it fell was rich in sulfur. This substance evaporated because of the abnormal heat and gathered into massive clouds. This caused acid rains that were falling on Earth for several more weeks. Our newly discovered comet is 10 times bigger. If it were flying toward Earth, you'd see it with the unaided eye long before the impact. It looked like a moving star in the night sky. A few days before the comet reached our planet, you'd see it even during the day. You'd be able to distinguish its long tail, too. When the comet entered the atmosphere, it'd produce a booming sound so loud you'd hear it on the other side of Earth. At this point, the comet would begin to heat up because of friction with the air. It'd start burning. Countless pieces of debris would break away from the main body of the meteorite and fall to Earth. As soon as Bernardinelli Bernstein touched the surface of the planet, we'd see a flash so bright it'd outshine the sun. In a fraction of a second, a colossal amount of energy would be converted into heat. This would create 
the most powerful explosion in the history of our planet. It literally rip out chunks of ground and throw them into the air. The blast wave would incinerate everything within a few hundred miles. It continued to spread in different directions, breaking and bending trees. At one point, it reached snow-capped mountains and trigger huge avalanches that would cover many villages. The blast wave would go around the planet, shattering glass and buildings on all continents. Tsunami waves would be so high they would cover entire coastal cities. The most powerful earthquake in history would break the ground and create deep cracks. After the impact, billions of tons of dust and ash would rise into the air. A giant black cloud would completely block the sun's rays. Earth would be plunged into darkness. All the debris in the air would start melting. They'd turn into liquid lava and fall back to the surface, causing even more damage. The ash and dust in the air would cover the sun for several more months. During this time, the temperature on Earth would drop by several degrees. Even if they were hiding in deep shelters and bunkers, people, as well as all other living organisms on the planet, would be unlikely to survive this event. Fortunately, Bernard and Ellie Bernstein isn't going to approach Earth. Right now, the comet is about 20 astronomical units away from the Sun. That's 20 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. It means the comet will soon cross the orbit of Uranus. In 2031, it'll be 11 astronomical units away from our star. That's just outside Saturn's orbit. This is going to be the closest Bernard and Ellie Bernstein will approach the Sun. Then it will begin its flight back to the edge of the solar system. But the comet is bound to return again. It'll move away from the Sun and slow down until the star's gravity pulls it back. Then the comet will make another circle around our solar system. But that will take about 3 million years. Right now, we have other meteorites to worry about. For example, 3200 Phaedon. It crosses the orbits of Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. Then it goes around the Sun and comes back. This cycle takes about 523 days. Then it starts over again. This meteorite is considered potentially hazardous because it crosses Earth's orbit at 7.5 Earth-Moon distances. During one of its last approaches to Earth, this 3.6-mile-wide block of rock showered our planet with small meteors. Since the asteroid often passes by the Sun, its surface is most likely to look like the dry bottom of a mud swamp. It's covered in scales and cracks. As it flies past Earth, these scales break off and cause meteor showers. But the largest, potentially hazardous asteroid is the 1999 JM8. It's about the size of 77 soccer fields. It passes by Earth at nine lunar distances. Its closest approach to our planet will happen in August 2137. If such a meteorite were to hit Earth, an entire continent could be wiped out. The rest of the world would experience massive tsunamis, but would survive the event. So naturally, scientists are thinking of ways to protect the planet from such a disaster. The first solution is a controlled Big Bang. One of the laws of physics says that if you apply some force in one direction, it'll cause a reaction in the opposite direction. So if we spot an asteroid that is about to collide with Earth, we'll need to send a rocket toward it. This way, we'll produce a controlled explosion, not inside, but right above its surface. The blast will be directed upward, and the asteroid will shift downward. Even this tiny shift would be enough to change the trajectory of the asteroid, and then it'll fly past Earth. Another way is to send a heavy object, like a spaceship, toward the space body. Every heavy object has its own gravity, so the spacecraft will have to fly close to the asteroid, which will attract the ship to its surface, but the engines of the spacecraft will resist. The ship will start pulling the asteroid in the opposite direction. This will change the trajectory of the asteroid, and our planet will remain intact. We can also ram the asteroid with the spaceship. Bang! Or, we could build a space station, like the ISS. It would be equipped with a bunch of huge magnifying lenses. We would send the station closer to the sun and start looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. Then, we'd point all the lenses so that the sun's rays would focus on the giant rock. The heat would begin to vaporize the matter from the asteroid's surface. That's where physics would come into play again. The matter would evaporate upward, and the asteroid would move downward. We could also wrap the asteroid in a reflective film, something like foil. Usually, 
Space bodies absorbed most of the sun's rays, but if the asteroid was covered in foil, the rays would bounce off its surface. This would create a weak pushing force. That should be enough to avoid the collision. Of course, we could attach rocket engines to the asteroid. This way, we would be able to not only change its trajectory, but also control it. But that would depend on the size of the asteroid and the number of engines. And then, we could use this massive rock to ram it into other, larger asteroids. Imagine flying in a spacecraft in a cloud of asteroids at high speed. You dodge one, one more, and then hit the gas pedal to the floor and crash into an asteroid at full speed on purpose. This is exactly what NASA is going to do in the near future. The entire mission will begin at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California on November 24th. Let's follow it step by step. So the Falcon 9 booster rocket is already on the launch pad. It's as tall as a 22-story building, or 11 giraffes. And it can get about 8 tons of cargo into orbit. So you could send a big elephant into space and a supply of food for it. Countdown. 3, 2, 1, ignition! Smoke clouds everywhere, and the rocket begins to gain altitude. Nine engines are working at full power to accelerate the rocket. At its peak, it reaches speeds 10 times faster than the speed of sound. And then the rocket engines shut down, and the rocket's first stage undocks to return to Earth. A couple of seconds later, the second stage receives the ignition command. It turns on its one engine and climbs even higher to orbit. The cargo capsule then opens and releases the DART spacecraft. DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Once released, the spaceship deploys two large solar panels. It'll convert solar energy into electrical energy to power a revolutionary ion engine. Conventional engines create thrust by burning tons of fuel and ejecting it outward. The rocket itself is essentially pushing off the emitted gases. The ion engine will not burn fuel. It'll use a strong electric field to accelerate the ionized gas. Like conventional rockets, it'll eject this gas and create thrust by repelling it. And though the ion engine produces less thrust, it can accelerate the spacecraft to higher speeds. So regular rocket engines have an excellent performance on the road. They push the pedal to the metal, burning a bunch of fuel, while the ion engine slowly accelerates. But when a conventional rocket needs to make a refueling stop, the ion spacecraft will whiz past the regular one at insane speeds. So the DART spacecraft begins its year-long journey. By comparison, a flight to Mars would take about seven months. Fast forward one year ahead, and we've arrived. This is the asteroid Didymos. The far point of its orbit is two astronomical units from our star. That's two Earth-Sun distances. At this point, the Sun begins to pull the asteroid back, and then it approaches the closest point to the star, one Earth-Sun distance. That is, its orbit lies very close to the orbit of our planet. Didymos made its closest approach to Earth at a distance of about 4.8 million miles. That's 20 times farther than the Moon's orbit. It takes 770 days to complete one such revolution around the Sun. So Didymos is not considered a hazardous asteroid, but in the future, it'll approach the Earth even closer. And the consequences of a collision with it could be catastrophic, given its size. It's bigger than two Empire State Buildings, and it rotates at a rate of one revolution in two hours and 15 minutes. So it has a tremendous amount of energy. Plus, it has an asteroid companion. It's a small pebble 520 feet wide. It's like 12 school buses or 10 train cars. Its orbital period, that is, the time it takes the pebble to make a complete circle around the asteroid, is about 11.9 hours. NASA believes that asteroids up to 80 feet wide are likely to burn up completely in our atmosphere due to friction with the air, so they're not hazardous. Asteroids between 80 feet and half a mile in size will not burn completely and could cause severe damage. And asteroids over half a mile have the potential to wipe out large cities or even entire states. In that sense, we can consider Didymos potentially hazardous. So we're going to test one way of defending against asteroids on it, kinetic impact. That's why we sent DART here. So our spacecraft is going to hit an asteroid, only not its main body, but its little companion. DART is already moving toward it at about four miles per second. At that speed, a trip from New York to Washington, DC would take less than a minute. And a trip across the United States from coast to coast 
would take about 10 minutes. Dart is getting close. Three seconds to impact. Two, one, bam! The spacecraft crashes into the asteroid at full speed. What are your predictions? Asteroid explodes and is blown to pieces? Or asteroid flies off the main body into space like a billiard ball? Well, scientists predict that this collision will reduce the speed of this small asteroid by a fraction of a percent, but it'll still be enough to reduce its orbital period by a few minutes. Then our telescopes on Earth will be able to study the effects of the collision in more detail. And to learn even more, we'll send another spacecraft to Didymos on another mission. This is Hera. It'll be launched in 2024 and is scheduled to arrive at Didymos around 2027. This spacecraft will carry a bunch of research equipment to assess the collision damage done by DART. When it arrives, Hera will take many pictures of the small asteroid, including a fresh impact crater. Hera will also be carrying two CubeSats. These are miniature space probes, smaller than a shoebox. It'll launch these mini satellites, and they will make an even closer approach to the asteroid. They will study this space rock for three to six months. At the end of the mission, one of them will attempt to land on the asteroid's surface to learn even more about its composition and internal structure. It's also possible Hera will carry a mini impactor. This thing will have to make another impact on the asteroid. Then scientists will be able to evaluate the difference in impacts with a large spacecraft and a small one, and understand how we can defend against asteroids in the future. In theory, we don't need to send a giant rocket to a dangerous asteroid to destroy it. A single strike might be enough to shift the trajectory of the asteroid slightly. On a cosmic scale, changing the trajectory, even by a fraction, would dramatically change the asteroid's finish point. But kinetic impact is not the only way to deal with hazardous asteroids. Check out the gravity tractor. For this technique, we need to send a spacecraft toward the asteroid too. Only, it won't crash into it. It'll have to go into its orbit. Any asteroid has a force of attraction, and it'll pull the spacecraft toward it. But the spacecraft's engines will keep it at the same altitude, so the asteroid itself will start attracting to the spacecraft. This method is reliable enough, but it takes a long time. And it'll only work if we detect a potentially hazardous asteroid many years before it arrives at Earth. We should have enough time to send a spacecraft to the asteroid and then carry out an asteroid tractor technique. The other option is a laser. When an asteroid is found, we need to aim a powerful laser beam at it. It'll heat up a certain point on the asteroid, causing the material there to evaporate. This is where physics comes into play. The material on the asteroid evaporates upwards. It makes the asteroid itself move downward. Just like our rocket engines work, the burning fuel is ejected one way and the spacecraft moves the other. We can also use solar power instead of lasers. To do that, we need to build a big space station, which would be equipped with a lot of magnifying glasses. Have you ever tried to burn letters on a wooden surface with a magnifying glass? Well, we'd be doing the same thing, but with an asteroid. The space station will have to focus lots of the sun's rays into one point on the asteroid. Again, the material evaporates because of the high temperature, and this causes the asteroid to change its trajectory slightly so that it flies past our planet. How about foil? That's right, we can avoid a collision with an asteroid by using ordinary foil. We would have to wrap the asteroid in the same reflective material. Then the asteroid won't absorb the sun's rays, but will instead reflect them. This creates a little pressure on the surface of the asteroid. It's as if the sun's rays are pushing the asteroid and it'll be able to change its trajectory. And not the most obvious but reliable option is conventional rocket engines. We can put several powerful engines on the asteroid. This would create thrust and change the trajectory of the asteroid. And if there are enough engines, we can even take control of the asteroid. So when a bigger space rock appears on the horizon, we'll turn on our engines and point the asteroid straight at it. Such a collision can completely destroy even a very large asteroid. And it would make for one epic light show. 66 million years ago, I wasn't around then, a huge asteroid hit the Earth and triggered the mass extinction of almost all living creatures on the planet, including dinosaurs. Had the space object crashed somewhere else, some dinosaurs would have been able to survive and still live nowadays. According to some research, the asteroid had about 1 in 10 chances of wiping out the dinosaurs and other animals of that time. 
it was way more likely to just hit the ground without any strong destructive consequences. To understand how things could have turned out if the place of the collision had occurred elsewhere, we need to find out what happened that day and why the disaster turned out to be so devastating. This huge space rock fell into the coastal area of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. This caused a chain reaction that triggered natural disasters around the world. The place the asteroid hit is called Chicxulub Crater. Now half of this area is underwater. The asteroid was about 7.5 miles in diameter and moving at a speed of 27,000 miles per hour. This rock, bigger than Everest, was rushing toward Earth faster than the speed of sound by almost 40 times. Wow! The energy released in the collision was as powerful as an explosion of about 10 billion atomic bombs. And the destructive force of the blast wave was just one of several disasters. The asteroid happened to fall in one of the worst possible places. And because of the way it fell, it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. Imagine you're jumping into the water like a professional athlete, vertically, leaving hardly any splashes behind. And now think of how much water splashes when you jump into the pool like a cannonball. So the asteroid landed the cannonball way. The second disaster the asteroid provoked was soot burning. A small part of the Earth's surface consists of rocks. Only a tiny percentage of that part was rich in oil and sulfur back then. The asteroid burned and lifted so much soot into the air that it would be enough to fill an indoor baseball stadium. According to research, 65 million years ago, only 13% of the surface of the entire planet could have contained the necessary amount of organic material for the formation of such a volume of soot. That's why this place was considered the worst. If the catastrophe had happened on the territory of the other 87%, then dinosaurs would have been alive today. A huge cloud of soot and carbon dioxide rose into the air and covered the sun. The soot turned the sky gray and partially blocked sunlight. This led to a quick drop in temperatures almost all over the planet. It seemed like Earth was inside a gray veil. Many plants and animals couldn't survive the cold snap. Trees began to wither because of the lack of sun. The photosynthesis process was disrupted. The cold and withering of trees led to another catastrophe, global famine. Herbivores couldn't survive because they lost almost all of their food. Plants, flowers, and trees didn't manage to get through the catastrophe. These destructions spread far beyond the asteroid impact site. Hot dust particles, asteroid chunks, and small pieces of rocks settled to the ground across the continent and caused large-scale forest fires. Burning trees threw even more soot into the air, which made the situation even worse. The huge asteroid brought heavy metals with an increased level of toxicity from space. The melting of these substances during the collision provoked firestorms. The asteroid didn't only hit continental land, but also water, which triggered a huge tsunami. But that's not the worst part. The seabed was filled with sulfate, and when the energy of the asteroid burned it, it provoked the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The acid cloud mixed with a cloud of soot and began to spread throughout the sky. Hot rock particles were falling to the ground like fire rain. An acid rain started because of sulfur. It lasted for almost several days and left no chance for the animals to survive. Acid rain made the water in rivers, lakes, and seas poison. The acid destroyed anything that couldn't burn. A part of the clouds went to wreck the land and the other part, the ocean. This made the situation even worse, as sulfur droplets wiped out a huge amount of seaweed and phytoplankton. The ocean generates almost half of all oxygen reserves on our planet. Those days, the sea creatures living in its upper parts were destroyed. It wasn't the blast wave, but lack of sun, acid, darkness, and cold that became the main reasons for the extinction of dinosaurs. But even when some lizards escaped from fires and sulfur, they met the sea element. The asteroid impact caused large-scale tsunamis across the planet. The very first wave was around one mile in height. That's almost three times higher than the Empire State Building. Billions of gallons of water were moving at 90 miles per hour. A wave this strong could easily destroy half of New York today. The meteorite created a series of waves 52 feet high. 
Massive walls of water the size of five-story buildings collapsed on the shore and demolished everything in their path. Lack of sunlight, temperature drop, acid and fire rains, reduced oxygen production, forest fires, giant tsunamis, and the explosive wave with the power of a billion atomic bombs – all this reduced the biological diversity of Earth by 75%. Yeah, that'll change your climate for sure. Giant asteroids used to hit Earth before, but they never caused such disasters all over the planet. What if this asteroid had fallen into another place, say a forest, far from water and mountainous terrain? This would have caused severe fires. A huge black cloud of ash would have risen into the sky and obscured the sun. But it would have unlikely generated acid or fire rains. Most of the species of the planet could have survived this catastrophe. What if the meteorite had fallen somewhere among the ice and snow? This would have provoked a rapid increase in temperature across the planet. Huge tsunamis would have sunk big tracts of land. However, ash and sulfur dioxide wouldn't have filled the sky. Acid rain wouldn't have hit the ocean. Many marine creatures could have survived and lived to this day. And dinosaurs, far from the oceans, wouldn't have noticed the meteorite fall at all. Probably the most terrible events would have occurred if a meteorite had fallen on an active volcano. This would have triggered the largest lava release in history. Destructive earthquakes would have begun, and the whole sky would have been covered with volcanic ash. What if the meteorite had hit some desert? It would have melted billions of tons of sand and turned it into glass. Just imagine glass dunes that heat our planet even more. And we could dig up the well-preserved remains of ancient lizards out of the glass. Anyway, there were many different possible catastrophic scenarios. And the worst of them came true for the dinosaurs. They are unlikely to return. Although, perhaps, they can be reborn. Scientists were inspired by an idea from a famous Hollywood movie. They wanted to find a mosquito that got stuck in amber. They would extract dinosaur DNA from it. But there was a problem with this. The oldest DNA sample they managed to find was 1 million years old. Dinosaurs were extinct about 66 million years ago. Besides, DNA is a very fragile thing. The probability that it could have been preserved intact somewhere for so long is very small. So, instead of searching for this ancient dinosaur DNA, scientists decided to take DNA from the closest ancestors of these lizards, birds. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaur paws could have turned into wings and elongated mouths could have become beaks. Pelicans are very similar to pterodactyls, ostriches resemble velociraptors, and chickens are very much like T. rex. Okay, let's just stop and imagine for a moment a chicken the size of a T-Rex. Hey, you! You want a piece of me? Now, the common chicken is recognized as the closest relative of the huge lizard. Remove the plumage from it, cover it with scales, give a toothy mouth instead of a beak, and attach a long tail. And you get a real, mini Tyrannosaurus rex by body structure and movement. Deep in its DNA, there are similar genes that formidable predators have. With the help of genetic engineering, scientists plan to play with its DNA and try to reverse the evolution, which means breeding dinosaurs can become a reality. Well, that could come back to bite you. This is it. The end! You're packing up everything you can in whatever bags you have. Food, clothes, toiletries. The news in the background goes on, red alerts flashing all over the screen. You check your watch, and you know it's time. You haven't even finished packing yet. You rush out of your house and see everyone else lugging suitcases hurriedly. You get in your car and drive out as fast as you can, dodging all the people running around. You arrive at a secluded place in the woods. You've been working on your personal bunker for years. It's able to withstand the worst conditions. Tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, and, hopefully, asteroids. You run to the bunker, hidden away next to some bushes and trees. There's no way anybody would know it's there. The door looks like the ones in bank vaults that contain huge piles of money. On the other side, a ladder that goes down 30 feet through a dark tunnel. The first thing you do is power up the place. It's all run on heavy-duty batteries, powered from solar panels above. As a backup, a fuel-powered generator. 
Hopefully, you won't need to use it. But your life motto is, a person can't have too many fail-safes. The entire bunker is built from concrete and steel to maintain maximum durability. The walls are several feet thick. You can finally let out that sigh of relief because you made it just in time. You suddenly feel the ground vibrate, the walls tremble, fear tightens in your chest when all the cabinet doors shake open and the stored food starts tumbling out. Did you miscalculate? Is this thing going to hold up? The asteroid made contact, far from where you are, but it feels like it fell right on top of you. The sound is deafening and the shock waves seem to never end. The light flickers. The flying dust is hazing your vision and filling your lungs. You grab a mask with one final thought. This is it. The bunker's going to collapse. At least I tried. One month later. You're making breakfast after another sleepless night. Luckily, you stored more than enough food. And what variety? Canned tuna, corned beef, beans, sardines. Then there's the dried goods. Rice, powdered milk, pasta, noodles, and even some treats. Honey and chocolate. You also allowed yourself soda and juice. But water makes up most of your stored hydrators. This place has been, and will continue to be, your home for, who knows, weeks, months, years? The thought sends a chill down your spine. At least you're in an ideal location, far inland and away from any coast, so any possible tidal waves shouldn't have flooded your area. You can't imagine what it looks like up there. Please don't let it be like the dinosaurs part two. You need a distraction to take your thoughts away from the worst case scenario. You walk through your house like a real estate agent giving a tour to potential buyers. At the entrance, you have the living quarters, a couch and coffee table with some outdated magazines and board games. In front of you, a small flat screen TV with a DVD player. Sadly, no internet, but all those movies should keep you company. On a table nearby, you have a radio and telecommunication speaker that's like your ears and mouth to the outside. You also have your library with all sorts of books, classics, contemporary, and any genre, as long as it keeps your mind occupied. And if none of that helps you pass the time, there's always the video game consoles linked up to the TV. Ah yes, the gym area. It's modest, just a treadmill and some dumbbells. You try to get plenty of cardio and weightlifting in to keep yourself fit and healthy. Well, for someone living underground like a mole. Of course, you have the kitchen. It's got a good-sized mini-fridge and a stainless steel sink with a bunch of cabinets storing all the goodies. You hook this place up with plumbing and pipes, bringing in clean drinking water. In case those stop working, you have water stored. The bathroom has a functioning toilet, sink, and a shower that's connected to the hot water pump. There's even a washer and dryer nearby. There's also a little workshop area. If something breaks, you can fix it here. You can also build some things out of scrap material, a chair or table if need be, a little figurine to put on the shelf and keep you company. Down some steps, you have another vital piece of the bunker, the greenhouse. It's all on lamps with artificial sunlight for obvious reasons. You'd be way worse off if you didn't have your fresh fruits and veggies. It's all self-sustaining too. Any rotten or bad crops go into making compost for the soil to keep it well nourished. You can forget about relying on meat for protein. Quinoa, beans, lentils, chickpeas, mushrooms, they get the job done. And just in case you're not getting every single mineral your body needs, you manage to stock up on multis. Vitamin D is a big one for life underground without the sun. Not far away from your little subterranean farm is your bedroom. It's got a queen-size bed, nightstand on the right, small wardrobe on the left. You don't have much variety in your attire, but who's going to notice if you wear the same outfit twice? The dust mites? You go down a ladder to find the generator room. There's a reason why it's further underground and sealed with soundproof material. 
the generator kicks in every now and then, and it's pretty noisy. It's also hooked up with the ventilation system, so the exhaust goes outside. Then there's the lung room. All these weird looking boxes are pumps that bring in oxygen from the outside world. But it has an advanced filtration system to clean the air before pumping it into your shelter. Down here is also the storage room. Every spare part of anything goes here. Extra couch, mattress, sinks. Even two freezers for those frozen goods, just in case. So, what's a day like in the bunker? First, whip up some breakfast and enjoy a cup of coffee. Then, you head over to the communication radio to hear if there's any news from the outside world. So far, there's been none. As soon as you're done, you head to the greenhouse for some quick farming. You really like being in there because it feels like you're outside enjoying nature. At least a little bit. You pick anything that's ripe and bring it into the kitchen for a wash. And wouldn't you know it, it's lunchtime. You prepare yourself a nice salad of cucumbers, tomatoes, and lettuce. Some beets on the side, pasta, and you eat it up. After lunch, you pop in a DVD you haven't watched in a while. After the movie, you go around and do a quick check on the oxygen levels and water. Today happens to be your scheduled generator checkup as well. You head down to the basement to glance at the fuel level and oxygen filters. All good so far. Though, the thought of an even more extended stay worries you. What if you run out of fuel? You spend a few hours in the workshop tinkering around. Currently, no fixer-upper projects, and you're not feeling especially creative today. So you head to the gym. Today's leg day. Ugh, you dread it. Some things never change. Before you know it, it's time for dinner. You heat up some noodles and chill in the living room, listening to some tunes in the music player. This place cost you a little over $100,000 from digging up the site to construction and finally installing all the necessary systems needed for survival. And that's not including the extra food and personal activities for the bunker. Yes, you're lucky. All those luxuries make life good. Almost. Nothing new from the outside world after a whole month. You've always been a bit of an introvert, but this place is starting to push you a little. You're getting lonely. The sound of the radio snaps you out of your thoughts. Static? No, a muffled voice. Someone's trying to contact you. You bolt over to the communication radio, nearly tripping over your own feet from the shock. We made it! Ha! You're overcome with emotion. You've gotten pretty used to your life underground, but it's finally time to swing the door open and head out into the world. They ruled the planet for over 170 million years and then disappeared. History says it was a huge city-sized asteroid that came from space and hit the land of the Yucatan Peninsula around 66 million years ago. It caused terrible environmental changes, debris in the air blocking the sunlight so the plants couldn't survive. Temperatures on Earth's surface plunged. The animals were struggling to survive until they finally went extinct. At least, that's something many paleontologists believe happened. Now, they found out dinosaurs were about to go extinct even before the asteroid. Their diversity started to go down 10 million years before the asteroid. Older, long-living species didn't evolve enough to adapt to all changes in the environment, such as higher sea levels, massive volcanic activity, cooler periods. Dinosaurs preferred a warm climate because it helped them to keep a stable body temperature. Dinosaurs lived on all seven continents, even in Antarctica. That's because it wasn't all ice back then. Around 90 million years ago, Antarctica was a swampy rainforest with a warm, pleasant climate. It was even in a different location, only 560 miles from the then South Pole. That was the time of the warmest climate on our planet. The sea level was 560 feet higher than today, and the tropical sea surface could reach temperatures up to 95 degrees. Antarctica still had something like polar night, months without sunlight, but the climate around the South Pole was mild and temperate, with no ice masses. 
Dinosaurs didn't shed their skin in one long piece like today's reptiles do. Scientists believe they shed it in small pieces, had something like dinosaur fur fur. There was a dinosaur, Pegomastax, that looked like a cross between a porcupine and a parrot. It had one-inch-long jaws and ate plants. It had a short beak and self-sharpening long teeth. They were like scissors this small dinosaur used to slice up plants. Our modern lion has a mighty bite, but a big and scary T-Rex bites more than two times stronger. The king of the dinosaurs has the strongest bite amongst all land animals, three and a half times stronger than today's record holder, the Australian saltwater crocodile. It also had the longest teeth, almost 10 inches long, the length of an iPad. Most modern animals are either warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Dinosaurs were somewhere in between. Scientists think they mainly were mesotherms, which means the activity of their muscles could warm their bodies, but their body temperature could fluctuate too. Many dinosaurs, such as Triceratops and Stegosaurus, had spikes, plates, horns, crests, or other bizarre structures on their bodies. In the beginning, Scientists thought that's for things like defense. They had neither sharp teeth nor hooked claws on the toes to hunt. But soon, they expanded the theory. It was probably a way to impress their mates and identify members of their kind. One species, namely Pachycephalosaurus, even had a funky bone hat on top of its head. Scary, tall as buildings, massive. That's what we saw in the movies. But dinosaurs mainly were human-sized or even smaller. Bigger bones were easy to be fossilized, so that's why we mostly find gigantic species. Eoraptor, or Dawn Stealer, was the first named dinosaur. Small and toothy, like me, it got its name because it comes from the dawn of the dinosaur age. The size of a German shepherd, but probably not that friendly. Arched back, sharp bony plates, curved tail. Ankylosaurus were some sort of giant, muck spikier dinosaur version of an armadillo. Its weak spot was a soft underbelly, but meat-eating dinos that were after this one had to flip that guy first to get there. Still, it was really tough because of their impressive gear. Scientists believe they even had bony eyelids. Some dinos ate meat, others plants, and some of them could nibble even on pebbles. One dinosaur, called Gallimimus, couldn't physically chew all those plants it ate, so it would ingest pebbles to mash up the food. Gallimimus looked like some weird alien mix of dinosaur and bird. But it couldn't dribble a basketball because its wrists weren't capable of keeping the palms parallel to the floor. And they had no three-point shot. The largest dinos were plant eaters. Meat eaters, or so-called theropods, were mostly smaller. One reason is that plant-eating dinosaurs were very greedy. They would devour enormous amounts of food, sometimes even swallowing the entire branches without chewing. Some of the biggest could eat a ton of food every day, like a bus-sized pile. There were also more plant-eating dinosaurs than the other ones. Scientists are still not sure if meat-eating dinosaurs were able to coordinate themselves in hunting groups. They were probably unfriendly towards each other, especially when it comes to sharing prey. Fossils and the shape of delicate bones in the eye tell dinosaurs mostly roamed around during the day. Scientists think only smaller meat-eating dinos, like Velociraptor, were active during the night. They were after those small mammals snuffling around and trying to find food while big dinosaurs were asleep. Or that's what they thought. Those small mammals were usually burrowing animals that survived both dinosaur reign and ice age hiding underground. Not all mammals were hiding from dinosaurs. Some small but sneaky creatures, like Repinomammus, would steal the eggs from big dinosaurs, which was a big thing considering they had to trick the mama dinosaur first. Researchers believe dinos tried to flap on the ground to get faster at running up inclined terrains to catch their prey. Such behavior caused them to learn how to fly, which of course happened through thousands of years. Dinosaurs were fuzzy and fluffy. They are related to birds, but even those early dino species that didn't fly had feathers, like gigantic, scary, fuzzy T-Rex. Movies lied. You just can't stand still and expect a T-Rex would pass you by. Its vision was probably better than one today's raptors have. Even without it, they still had a pretty good sense of smell. 
running could help it though, scientists calculate T-Rex could probably run at 12 miles per hour. It would shatter its bones at a greater speed. Some dinos had tails more than 45 feet long. Tails helped them to keep their balance when running, especially those that walked on two legs. Velociraptors were not like raptors we see on the screen, but more like some sort of prehistoric chickens. Small, a little bit bigger than a turkey, two feet in height, probably had feathers, hollow bones just like birds, mostly loners. But they were probably among the smartest dinos. Their brain was big compared to their bodies. They were as intelligent as today's ostriches. The name Velociraptor means speedy thief. Stegosaurs had a pretty big body, spiky plates, and a tiny brain, the size of a walnut or lime. But at least it had its own air conditioner. Researchers found out its spikes were filled with veins that transferred blood and developed a theory that they were cooling its giant body that way. Dimorphodon was the flying reptile with a wingspan of 8 feet and multi-purpose teeth. Teeth in the upper jaw were longer, sharper, and better for catching food from the water. The teeth in the bottom jaw were better for holding the game in transit. One of the first potential dinosaur discoveries was in China, 3,500 years ago. No one knew about dinosaurs then, so people thought teeth they found could belong to dragons. The Hadrosaurus was a duck-billed dino with more than a thousand teeth. When they would fall off, it could grow new ones indefinitely. Dinosaurs' eggs were pretty big, some as big as beach balls. Now that's an omelet. The Baryonyx was a big fan of fish. Its name means a heavy claw, and it got it because of big extended claws that were pretty sharp and made up the thumb of each hand. When catching fish, they used the claws like spears. Mosasaurus, also popular in movies, was not quite the dinosaur but a marine lizard, closely related to monitor lizards and snakes. Like a snake, it had jaws that could expand when swallowing the food. These creatures were speedy. They had a tail fin and flipper-like paddles instead of arms and legs. Researchers believe they had a weak sense of smell and poor perception of depth, so they had to develop a unique hunting technique, waiting for their snack to come up to the surface for some air.